All right, so in this lecture, we'll be talking about some of the basics of grammar and style. Um, just to note that it's important to start thinking about your final paper topics. So you might start thinking about reviewing um, topics and classes that you've enjoyed, thinking about experiments that you liked or topics that you enjoy talking about. And we'll do more on this next week. Uh, so today we're gonna cover some of the basics of grammar and style. Uh, the first thing we'll cover is bias-free language. And so you had the reading from the APA manual, which covers a lot of things. Um, make sure that you go in and read all of the different subsections. Um, so there's the general section. And then if you go back, there's specific groups. So go take a look at all of those. So you have a sense of um, what kind of language you should be using um, in various contexts. Um, some, some general information. So for or general guidelines um, in using bias-free language. First, make sure you're focusing on relevant characteristics. Um, so if you're doing study on, um, you know, cognition, then somebody's sexuality probably is not at all relevant. Um, and so there's no need to, to talk about it. So kind of focusing on the things that are relevant and might influence what you're studying. Um, in general, you want to try to be appropriately specific. Um, so this might mean in terms of the age category, right? So you would want to say, um, you know, adults ages um, 25 to 35 rather than just saying middle adults. Um, you also want to be specific about the condition or the orientation rather than the category. So talk about patients with Alzheimer's um, versus people with disabilities, um, you know, mentioning if your study is um, about uh, lesbian women, you would want to say lesbian women rather than homosexuals, um, things like that. Um, even with income, um, people who fall below the federal poverty level versus of low socioeconomic status. The more specific you can be in the terminology you use, the better. Um, you also want to be, be sensitive to the labels that you are using. Um, so use the language that people use to describe themselves. Um, there are some exceptions to this, so you do need to be somewhat careful. Um, but um, for example, if you're doing a study with transgender individuals, um, you know, if you're looking at transgender men um, and they identify as men, then that is how you want to identify them. Um, Avoid using adjectives as nouns. Um, so I think this is one that we may slip into in our daily language, and this is something that you really need to get out of your writing. Um, so saying things like the poor, the gays, things like that, um, those are adjectives to describe people, um, and you don't want to use that. Um, similarly, don't label people with their condition. So um, labeling people with their condition would be things like saying, oh, autistics all do this or schizophrenics do this. Instead, these are people who have their condition. So children with autism or um, young adults uh, who have schizophrenia, um, they are not just their condition um, or just their disorder. And so we don't want to label them by that. Um, also, to help avoid confusion, make sure that you've clearly defined um, whatever you're talking about so that your audience is clear on what those labels mean. Um, and avoid false hierarchy. This is, um, you know, true. We'll talk a little bit more about race in the next slide, but, um, you know, you don't want to create a hierarchy where there is none. Um, so you need to be sure that you're, you're treating um, these groups the same way. Okay, so Two big ones, and again, you want to go through and read all of the different um, subcategories, but two big ones that we often use um, are, are gender and race and ethnicity. So you'll probably mention these in your paper where there's a good chance. Um, so a couple of rules and guidelines on those. Um, first, in regard to gender, the big things to remember are that male and female are adjectives, which means they need to be followed by a noun. So you should not be saying males do this or females do this. You could say male participants were more likely to engage in this behavior, but it needs to be followed by a noun. Um, men and women or girls and boys are the noun. So you can say men did this um, or girls did this, um, but um, male and female should be used as adjectives and so they should be followed by something else. Um, you can also, in this newest edition of APA, they have decided that they and them is okay um, for singular. So if you don't want to say things like his or her, um, because it could be a someone who is um, uh, a man or a woman, um, then you can say they instead. So if you might say, you know, individuals with schizophrenia are more likely to do something, um, they tend to believe in different things. So it could be a male or female. 
Okay, um, next is race and ethnicity. So remember that race refers to physical differences in a group that seem to have some kind of social significance, even if it's manufactured, whereas ethnicity refers to cultural characteristics. So this includes languages, practices, and beliefs. So they are different, and which one you're talking about will depend on the context. Um, likewise, kind of the terminology that you use will depend on your top population. Um, so you need to be really clear. And so I'm giving you kind of some general terms that are um, okay or approved, but you need to be really sure that you're using the right term for the context. Um, so um, a couple of general rules, you capitalize all races and ethnicity. So black and white should be capitalized. A um, Couple of kind of groups, words that you would use. So black or African-American, either one is okay. You may use one or the other depending on the context or the preference of your participants or your population. Um, white or European American, Native American or American Indian, um, Hispanics or, or Hispanic or Latino, Latino or Latinx. Um, but note that, um, especially for that one, um, the term you'll use depends a lot on your context. So for example, um, Hispanic refers to people who speak Spanish. Not all people in Latin America speak Spanish. So you'd wanna make sure that you use the term that generalizes. Um, you don't want to use the term minority. So minority generally refers to something less than. So you want to avoid that. Instead, if you're talking about a group, you might talk about people of color or underrepresented groups um, or things like that. And you want to make sure if you're comparing groups that you use parallel terms. So if you use African American, then you would want to use European American um, for consistency and again to make sure that you're treating these groups equally. Okay, um, so this is another try it yourself. So again, um, what I'd like you to do is re uh, is pause the video um, and go through and do each one of these. Okay, so the, the goal here is I want you to rephrase each sentence to reduce the bias. So you can go ahead and pause the video and do that now. Okay, and then the answer key um, is on, on this slide. Um, and so you can again pause the video and go through and compare. Um, so for the first one, the participants were asked to think of their favorite teacher from elementary school um, and rate him or her, right? We don't wanna assume that the teacher is female. Um, the experimenter can decide when he should provide the debriefing. Um, the experimenter may be male or female. So we wanna get rid of that assumption. Um, the third one, um, chairman, chairman or chairman, um, is a gender term. So we want to get rid of that and we can just say the department chair. Um, here we've got a lack of, of um, parallel um, description. So the participants were, sorry, this typo, were 20 male students and 20 co-eds. The co-eds are actually referring to female students. So um, we could say 20 men or 20 women. They've used male and female, but they've used it correctly because they have a noun following it. Um, next, a psycho psychological test battery was given to gay men and women. Um, again, the, when, the way this is used, it's really um, gay is referring to both um, the, the men and the women. And so to make it more specific, um, the preferred term is the gay men and lesbians or gay men and lesbian women would be okay too. Um, and to heterosexual men and women to determine whether there was a relationship between sexual abuse and sexual identity. Okay, another one that you can practice on. So um, again, you can pause the video. What I want you to do is rewrite this to reduce bias. And then I won't go through all the detail, but again, we've got issues with um, co-eds. We've got issues with male and female and men and women being used incorrectly. Um, so you can go ahead and, and uh, work on correcting those and take a look at that. And again, I recommend that you pause this to go through it. Okay, so next, um, we're going to talk about setting an academic tone. Um, and so remember, one of the first things we talked about in the first lecture um, was that you shouldn't write the way you talk. Um, so a couple of things to avoid. Um, contractions, can't, don't, won't, none of those things should uh, appear in formal academic writing. Um, you also want to avoid colloquial expressions, which are basically informal expressions, things like, you know, got to, things that you would say, but you wouldn't want to write. You also want to be careful about vague expressions, a lot, some, practically all. 
um, and hyperbolic language. So a hyperbole is an exaggerated statement that is not meant to be taken literally. Um, and so you want to avoid making those kinds of statements in writing where it's more likely that it could mistakenly be um, taken literally. Um, this is a resource for you. And again, you might come back to this, um, but an important part of kind of smooth academic writing is to use important transitions or use correct transitions. Um, and so these are really just some suggestions for phrasing that you might use. So you may come back to this um, as you actually start writing your paper. So here's another place that you can practice. I want you to try it yourself. I want you to read this paragraph and then go ahead and insert transitions here to make it smoother. Okay. And then here, really, this one was pretty basic transitions that were inserted just first, second, and finally. Um, and again, you could have used something different, but as long as you kind of identified this list, um, it makes it much easier for your reader to follow. Okay. And here is another example for you to pause and try yourself. Okay. And here again, we have, we have examples um, where here they're elaborating on things. So again, using that table um, is use, a useful way to kind of um, help identify where you might put in transitions. Okay. Um, we will talk about this more uh, later on, but um, one of the really important things that I want you to get out of this class is how to write a basic paragraph. So a paragraph like an essay needs a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, so a standard paragraph should be four to five sentences. If your paragraph is longer than one page, it's way too long. Um, but each paragraph should have a topic sentence. And that topic sentence should really be the paragraph's main point. It's like a mini thesis statement within your paragraph. Um, it lets the reader know what um, the paragraph is going to be about. You'll also have your transition in here if it's a multi-paragraph essay. Um, the middle sentences fill in the details of whatever argument you're making. And then the end sentence is also very important because it finishes off or kind of wraps up the topic. You want to end with a punch. Um, often your end sentence will also bring your paragraph back to whatever the main point of the whole paper is. Um, so we've covered some of this already. The topic sentence really hooks it to the previous paragraph. So um, you might use a repeat word or tie in a thought or use a transition word, say something like um, similar to the other arguments. Here's the, the next point. Um, and you want it to be broad enough to cover everything you cover in the paragraph. So you need to make sure that that topic sentence is relevant to the entire paragraph, not just the first argument you make. Um, with your end sentence, the things to remember are that it should restate your argument and tie your argument back to your thesis statement. So why is this paragraph relevant to the overall picture of your paper? Okay, um, you've got a couple of resources on Moodle on passive voice, so I'm just going to cover it very briefly. Um, but at a very... Um, at the most basic level, a simple sentence um, has a subject, verb, and object. Um, and so in the active voice, you start with the subject, then you have the verb, then you have the object. The explorer reached the subject. The explorer is the, uh, reached the summit, summit. The explorer is the person doing the action. Um, the verb is what is actually done. And then the object is the summit, what was reached. Um, you may have heard people tell you not to use the passive voice. And passive voice happens when you rearrange the order um, and put the object first. Um, and so, um, for example, if we said the summit was reached by the explorer, we've actually rearranged the sentence. Um, and you can see it's a lot more words. Um, it's a lot less clear. Even though they're technically saying the same thing, it is much harder to understand. Um, so I've got a bunch of resources on Moodle, but I think this is one of the handiest ones. Um, as you're trying to figure out if something is passive voice, you can actually insert by zombies at the after the verb if you have passive voice and it will make sense. So she was killed is passive voice by zombies. Um, it makes sense. Zombies killed her. Well, it doesn't make sense. So it's active voice. So you might play around with this a little bit.
Okay. Um, some other things to think about writing good sentences, um, compound sentences link to equally weighted simple sentences. So these include and, but, or, yet, still. Um, you might also link to complete sentences with a semicolon um, or with a colon. Um, so for example, the woman had on appropriate shoes for the snowstorm and she looked warm and prepared. She looked warm and prepared as a complete sentence, as is the first half. Um, the freshmen were using community bathrooms, semicolon. It was an unusual experience for some of them. Again, two separate sentences, but they're linked. In this case, they're linked with a semicolon because they can each be um, separate. Um, and then finally, the stranger anonymously paid for our meal. The waiter told us he often does this for large families. Here we've used a colon um, rather than a semicolon because it is elaborating on um, the, the first half. And then finally, a complex sentence hooks a lesser sentence to a main sentence. So this might be although, because, when, if, after. So some examples, the woman had on appropriate shoes for the snowstorm, although she still looked cold. Um, the freshmen were using community bathrooms because there were no private bathrooms. So stranger anonymously paid for our meal when we were in the bathroom. Now, the second half of each of these sentences is a sentence in and of itself, but it's less important than the first half. So this is called a complex sentence. Okay. Another really important part of writing a good sentence is making sure that you have parallel construction. Um, so when you are comparing things, when you're listing things, when you're contrasting things, you need to use equivalent form. You need to use the same form of the words. Um, so um, you also need parallel coordinators. So both and, either or, not only, but also. Um, so the example, knowing Greek and Roman antiquity is not just learning to speak their language, but also their culture. Now this is wrong because um, you, you would want each part to be parallel. So knowing the Greek and Roman antiquity is not just learning to speak their culture or to speak their language, but also to speak their culture doesn't make sense. Um, and so you would probably want to rephrase this into something like knowing Greek and Roman antiquity is learning their language and their culture, where you have the more parallel forms. Okay, so um, another opportunity for you to try this yourself. And again, you want to do um, pause this and go ahead and go through them to give you some a sense of kind of some of the kinds of mistakes that you might make and how to correct. So look at each of these examples, correct the faulty parallelisms. Okay, and so here are um, some examples of how you might correct them um, to help you identify where some of the errors are. Another big issue that I see in student writing is that it tends to be really wordy. I think many students have spent so much time worrying about getting to the right page count that they um, just throw in as many words as possible. Often though, um, the shorter your sentences are or the, the fewer words you use, the clearer um, your sentences are. So I really encourage you to go through and practice counting your words, figuring out which words actually carry meaning and rearranging them so you can um, make your sentences more clear. So here's one example, pause this and try it yourself. Um, what is a better way to say this? It was voted that there would be a drive for the cleanup of the People's Park. So um, there's a couple ways that you could fix this. So there are many ways, but the original sentence is 17 words, which is pretty lengthy for something that's not really saying a lot. Um, one of the issues is that it is in the passive voice. It was voted by zombies, makes sense. So it's passive voice. Um, and so you could rearrange it to something like, we voted to clean up the people's park. Down to it from 17 words to eight words. It's much clearer um, and, and much shorter and more concise. Other things that you might avoid is you're looking to correct wordy sentences, kind of looking at where you have words that don't really hold meetings, meaning. Um, stretchers, to be there is, it is, is when. Um, these kinds of things tend to add length to your sentence um, and really aren't saying anything. Of or which, the use of, um, and another one that we see common 
we um, is too many nouns. Um, so uh, if you use multiple nouns to describe things, advance notice, color, lipstick, reader interest, um, these kinds of things add length and don't necessarily add meaning. So you could convert to a word, a verb, you could use an adjective instead, you could just eliminate one of the words, you could make it possessive. Um, but these are some of the things to look for in, in trying to correct um, sentences that are excessively wordy. Okay, so here's a couple more for you to pause and try. And again, your goal is I've got uh, in the brackets is the word count for the original sentence. And so I want you to go ahead and rewrite each one of these and try to get the word count down. Okay, and then here is uh, some examples of how you might go about doing this. Um, and you can see I've got the answers in bold. And again, there's no one right way to do this, but um, the new word count in the brackets. Um, so what I would like you to do is use what has been included in this as well as in your reading and go back through your um, uh, psychology is a terrible major essay and go and rewrite it. Look for wordy sentences, look for topic and concluding sentences in your paragraphs, look for any kind of bias in language and try to apply what we have talked about to your, um, your paper to correct it. 